Hello, I just want to remind you about the um, introduction and conclusion words here um, in the lab manual. So make sure you take a look at this uh, like by pausing the screen or by looking in your lab manual before you watch this video, okay? Because it will help you, we'll cover a couple of these things um, as we go uh, throughout here. So what we're trying to do uh, here is solid phase extraction in this experiment. And solid phase extraction is similar to liquid-liquid extraction if you've taken um, organic chemistry before. Um, if you haven't, you'll get to it uh, relatively soon, if you're taking it now, I mean. Um, but basically what we are doing is using a solid substrate in a silica gel cartridge. And this is what the cartridge looks like. And you'll notice that this also looks like a um, typical uh, plastic uh, syringe. And it turns out that it is a typical plastic syringe, but what's not typical about it is it has this silica gel bed at the bottom of it. So we can load liquids into here um, and then use a plunger, a standard uh, plunger like you'd use on a plastic syringe, and we can push them through. Okay, And there are more sophisticated ways of doing um, solid phase extraction, including using things like robots, um, using vacuum boxes, things like this. This may be the least um, sophisticated way of pushing liquid through, but the principles that you're going to learn here are identical. So what we need to understand about this silica gel uh, cartridge is, um, or, or excuse me, this packed cartridge, okay, with this solid phase extraction um, layer in it, is what exactly is this substrate. And it turns out that it is silica gel, but it's it's been functionalized, in our case, with uh, CHD. Uh, C18 group. So this long carbon chain here. And as you could imagine, this long carbon chain is nonpolar. It also has these OHs, um, which are kind of alternating in there, and they are polar. So this uh, type of um, uh, solid phase is capable of attracting molecules that are kind of both polar and nonpolar. So that that's uh, what it's useful for. Now that's a little bit uh, excessive um, and a little bit too simplified, I guess is a better way of saying that. But generally speaking, this is this is going to be able to trap molecules that have some nonpolar parts and also maybe have some polar parts. And what we're going to do is we're going to use food coloring. And the reason that we're going to use food coloring is not because it's non-toxic, although that is an added benefit. Um, it's relatively non-toxic. Um, basically, the benefit is we can actually see what happens in this silica gel column. So for example, if you take some um, red or blue food coloring solution, and then for the most part at the beginning of the experiment, we're going to use blue food coloring. Um, what will basically happen is you'll put a blue liquid in this part. You will insert your plunger and you will push the blue liquid through the silica gel column. Now, a couple things could happen. One, you could get a blue liquid coming out the other end. If a blue liquid comes out the other end, then this, um, this solid phase is not trapping the blue food coloring. Another thing that could happen is you could get some kind of diffuse blue color throughout this entire, uh, uh, this entire solid phase, in which case you're kind of trapping it because it's not going through, but you're not trapping it well because it's basically um, moving through a lot of the column. The last thing you could get is, I guess there are others, but the last major thing you could get is a nice dark blue layer right at the top of this silica gel column. And what that's telling you is that this solid um, phase is extracting this uh, molecule very well. So the molecule of interest is having a very strong interaction with the silica gel, said another way we're trapping it. This is very important. So imagine for a second that a um, forensic scientist has a urine sample that they suspect has cocaine or metabolites in it. If they want to shoot that onto a GC or a GCMS, that's going to cause a problem, right? You can't put the compounds in urine into your um, GCMS. So you can't just inject the urine directly. So what do you need to do? Well, you need a way of trapping the cocaine or the cocaine metabolites and passing everything else from the urine through. 
And this is where these solid phase extraction cartridges come in very handy. Because if we put the urine sample through here and the cocaine is nicely trapped here, we then wash out all of the urine um, um, other things in urine through the column and then we use some kind of organic solvent to, to untrap that uh, cocaine and its metabolites you're going to then be able to separate that and put and, and make something that you can shoot into a GC and again this is not the type of silica gel that you used in the TLC experiment or if you've done column chromatography in the organic lab it's not the same type of silica gel this is a functionalized silica gel which has this C18 group which makes it more effective at uh, capturing nonpolar molecules because C18 as you could imagine is relatively nonpolar because it only contains carbon and hydrogen so this is kind of the general idea of how this SPE cartridge is going to work. And in this experiment, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, play with some of the conditions that are required um, in order to make this work efficiently. And essentially, it's a four-step process. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we talk about that, what I want to talk about is blue food coloring. So blue food coloring is this large um, molecule here and there are ty different types of blue food coloring but this is blue dye number one and you'll notice a few features of this molecule the first thing you'll notice is it's ionic it has these um negatively charges here negative charges here and this positive charge here the other thing you'll notice is it has a large conjugated system of single and double bonds that's probably what helps it to absorb visible light and the last thing to notice is it also has this carbon and hydrogen structure so these rings okay so it has a fair amount of non-polar regions even though it's ionic which makes it dissolve in water and dissolving in water makes it blue food coloring so if you have blue gatorade or blue kool-aid or whatever it may contain blue dye number one that's what makes it blue so this molecule has um, good features for being trapped by this type of column. So you have this polar OH group, you have this non-polar uh, C18 group. Now it's this is a little bit oversimplified and the reason it's a, it's a little bit oversimplified is because it, it's also going to take trial and error, right? You can't just guarantee that this is going to trap this. You actually need to get it and try it. So there are many different types of um, SPE columns available. It just happens to be probably empirically determined by experimentation determined that this is good at trapping these types of molecules. All right, this combination of nonpolar and polar it makes it good for uh, trapping a molecule here, which is ionic and nonpolar. All right, so now let's look at, and I'll talk about the red dye in a minute. Let's look at what we're going to do as a typical four steps for SPE in part one. Now you'll see that I have this broken into four parts. Your lab manual is broken into four parts. And if you look at the experimental part of pr the procedure in your lab manual, what you're going to see is there's a lot more detail. Okay, but I don't want to talk about all the details of exactly how much of these things to use and how, how to um, push them through the column and all this kind of stuff. I want to talk more about what we're trying to accomplish. All right, so step one, we condition the column with methanol and water. And this is, in part one, what we should do in order to get the SPE to hopefully work efficiently. Okay, this is our best uh, idea of how to make this work well. And then we're going to not do some of these things, or we're going to change some of these conditions and see what effects it has. So in the first case, we condition the column with methanol, then water. What happens to these C18 things um, is as they dry out, they become kind of tangled in each other is kind of a way to think about it um, because they do have um, nonpolar um, dispersion forces with one another. So they're kind of attracted to each other and adding some methanol kind of stretches them out and makes them active and ready to catch your analyte, in this case, blue dye. You don't want to leave methanol in there, though, because if they're interacting strongly with um, methanol, which although it's a relatively polar solvent, it's still organic solvent, then they're not going to um, 
be as able to catch this molecule. So first we had methanol, then we wash out the methanol with water. So methanol activates these by spreading out the C18 groups. Water then gets rid of the methanol so that these things, uh, the C18 groups, of course, are not going to have strong interactions with water because water is a very polar solvent. Next, we're going to load the column. So we're going to add the blue dye number one solution. And this is just water with blue food coloring in it, okay? The same as Gatorade or Kool-Aid or whatever. You're just going to add water with blue food, uh, food dye. Again, you're going to see one of three things. One, the blue food coloring goes all the way through and the column doesn't trap it. That's pretty unlikely to happen here because I already explained, we've empirically determined that this is a good um, type of substrate to catch blue food coloring. The second thing you could see happen is the blue is diffusely uh, spread out throughout this white uh, silica gel. Okay, that means it kind of catch it, caught it, but it wasn't great. Or in the ideal case, we'll see a tight blue line at the top of the silica gel. Again, we chose blue food coloring so you can see what's going on. If we were using cocaine and its metabolites, you would not see it because it's a white compound. So you would not actually see it on the silica gel. So that's the advantage of using blue food coloring. And for your first um, exposure to this, I think it's a really good idea to use uh, colored substances. All right, so we're going to load it and we're going to see what's going to happen. We're then going to wash the column with water. Now, in this particular case, that's probably unnecessary because the, um, the blue food coloring is blue food coloring in water. However, if we were using something like a urine sample, we want to wash that out because there's just naturally going to be some urine stuck in the column just because it gets stuck in there. So we want to wash that out. So we wash it out with water. Note that using water should not be able to draw the, um, the blue food coloring away from this nonpolar substrate because there's enough nonpolar stuff in the blue food coloring that we hope it'll stick. All right, it should stick. Said another way, if we get that tight blue line, when we put pass water through it, we should still have that tight blue line. Finally, we're going to elute the column with methanol. And there's no guarantee here, but again, one of three things can happen. Let's say we get that tight blue line of, um, of the food coloring. The first thing that could happen is the um, blue comes completely out. And what we end up with is on the other side in our, in our um, test tube, we end up with blue liquid, okay, containing methanol. And be careful with methanol. It's a little bit toxic and it's flammable. It's not, not the worst thing in the world, but do be careful with it. Okay, um, don't drink it and don't uh, set it on fire. But other than that, it's not so bad. Okay, but anyway, you have the methanol coming out. It's blue. That means the methanol effectively got the uh, blue food coloring away from this C18OH group, which means that the molecule is able uh, to be eluted. And this is what you would want if you were doing a drug sample. You put it on uh, from the urine, you wash out the urine, and then you wash out the metabolite to shoot into the mass spec. Another thing that could happen is that the blue food coloring appears diffusely through here. So it started as a tight line, and now it's diffusely, so it's like kind of a little bit blue all over the place. That means that the methanol is kind of getting it out, Okay, but it's not fully eluding the compound um, from the column. And here you might want to try either more methanol, which causes other problems because now you're diluting it and that could cause problems if you're going on to do GCMS, um, or a stronger solvent. In this case, a more nonpolar solvent, but you have a little bit of an issue here because you're using water. So it needs to be both nonpolar and also miscible with water. Finally, you could have the tight blue line stay after you have the methanol go through. And if the tight blue line stays after the methanol goes through, that means that methanol is not capable of removing, okay, it's not um, interacting strongly enough with the blue food coloring to remove it from the solid phase. In which case, you need to try a different solvent. And sometimes it can happen that you put methanol through to wash out the water, 
because it's now you have an organic solvent and then you put an even more organic solvent through say ethyl acetate okay um to wash something out but in this case the blue food coloring is ionic so methanol might be the right thing so this is basically our four steps to very briefly review we're first going to condition the column with methanol that separates out the C18 molecules so they're not kind of flat and overlapping and not really capable of catching anything. Then we use water to wash out the methanol because we don't want methanol there because if that's interacting with the C18, then it's going to be harder for it to interact with the blue food coloring. We then load the column with our blue food dye. We're going to expect three things. The blue food coloring is going to go through. It's going to appear diffusely in the solid phase, or we're going to get that nice tight ring near the top of the solid phase extraction, which means it caught it well, which is what we're hoping for. We're then going to wash the column with water. This is not completely necessary here, but if we were doing real solid phase extraction, this would be absolutely necessary to wash out the, you know, the urine as we talked about before. Then finally, we're going to loot with methanol. One of three things is going to happen. The stuff that comes through is going to be blue, and there's going to be no more blue in the column. That's the ideal case. We got rid of all the blue food coloring. Now it's in the methanol. If we wanted to, we could inject it into the GCMS. You wouldn't want to do that with blue food coloring, but if it was cocaine or its metabolites, you could do that. Second, it could be diffuse, which means that the blue food coloring is kind of coming out. Um, it's kind of eluding with the methanol, so we could try a um, stronger, more organic solvent. Or we could try some combination of solvents, depending on the case, whatever, or that kind of thing. Or finally, we still have that tightly packed blue line at the top of the SPE column, which means the methanol isn't eluding it at all. So I, I'm going to spend the most time here on part one, because I want you to understand what exactly each of these steps does. And I want to remind you one more time that in your lab manual, you're going to find a lot more details, right? This tells you the amounts and, and how to do the order and all this kind of stuff. Um, this is just kind of the simplified version. So we could talk about what we're doing in each step. All right. And then here I have comment on the column and the element for each step after the blue dye is loaded. All right, so you want to see what do you, what blue do you see on the column, if any, after each step. Probably condition is not necessary because you haven't added um, this. But after you load the column, where do you see the blue? And what do you see in the eluent? So what you'll notice is if you put blue food coloring uh, solution on top of the column and push it through, if the blue gets uh, if the blue food coloring gets caught in this tightly packed line, what comes through is a clear solution. Why? Because the blue food coloring is here and it's no longer in the water. So what comes out is going to be clear. So I hope this uh, gives you some idea of what you're looking for. Make sure you comment on each of these steps as you do this. Part two, we're going to look at the effect of conditioning the column. So here you're going to do two trials. Okay, the first, you're going to condition with methanol and water, same as part one, and then add, then load the blue food coloring. So you're going to do condition and then load. The second one, you're not going to bother to condition it, and you're simply just going to add the blue food coloring directly to the unconditioned column. And what you want to do is you want to comment on the blue solution in the conditioned and unconditioned column. And you again want to look at both the eluent, what comes out, is what comes out clear, or is what comes out blue, and you want to look at the SPE column itself. Is there a nice tightly packed blue line on the SPE column, or is it diffuse, or is it not blue at all? Okay, and then you want to talk about how does conditioning affect the loading? Okay, is it necessary to condition or are we just wasting solvent by conditioning? You have to remember there's always an efficiency argument. So if you do something and it doesn't, it's not necessary, well, that's a wasteful step. So that's what we're looking at here. Second, part three, we're going to look at solvent strength. All right, so you're going to condition, load, and wash the column as in part one. So you're going to do all of these three steps, just like part one. The difference is you're going to do this uh, for th two or three columns, depending on how you think about it. Okay, in the last step, a loot column, you're going to try 5% methanol, okay, which you're going to have to make. You're going to try 20% methanol, which you're going to have to make by volume okay and it tells you how to do that in the lab manual and then you can just use the part one results for 100 percent methanol 
So you're going to see if 5% methanol is able to pull that blue food coloring off the column, if 20% methanol is able to pull it off the column, or if we need to use 100% methanol. Again, you have a potential efficiency argument here. You could argue that water is less toxic and cheaper than methanol. So therefore, you know, the less methanol we could use, the better. You want to comment on what happens. What happens to that tightly packed blue, blue line in the SPE column? Okay, is 5% methanol enough to completely remove it and turn the eluent blue, the stuff that comes through the SPE column blue? Or is it still a tightly packed blue line and the 5% methanol does nothing? That's possible too. What about 20% methanol? And how do they compare to the 100% um, methanol uh, solution? Finally, the effect of pH. And for pH, we're going to um, use red dye. So you're going to condition the columns as in part one. You're going to put methanol through them to separate out those uh, C18 layers and, keep, and kind of make them ready to catch it. And then you're going to put water through to get rid of the methanol so they're ready to interact with that blue food coloring. When it comes to blue dye, you're going to do it at high and low pH. So when I say high, I kind of mean neutral. So here is blue food coloring in neutral. And you'll notice it's an ionic compound. Still has some organic stuff, still has conjugation, but it has these two minus charges. When you add HDL and you acidify this, you change it and you make it covalent. Now it's still polar, but it's no longer ionic. So this may be harder to trap in the column than this. So maybe with this, you get a diffuse red color throughout the column. Or maybe the column is completely clear when you load it and the C18OH column won't catch it at all. But if you add an acid and make it no longer ionic, maybe now a C18OH column is capable of catching it. So that might be your hypothesis for what's going to happen. Again, a lot of this is done empirically, so you know we can make some good guesses of what will work, and, and someone with a lot of experience could probably make very good guesses of what's going to work um, for catching these things, but at the end of the day, you still got to try it. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to condition the columns for the two different columns in part one, then you're going to add the neutral red dye, see if you get that nice tight red line at the top of the SBE column, a diffuse red color throughout, where you literally catch nothing. And the red food coloring just goes straight through and you get red in the eluent and nothing on the, on the column. And then you're gonna try it at the lower pH. So you're gonna lower the pH with some HCl and you're gonna see if it's more effective at catching it because you have changed it from an ionic compound to a covalent compound. Yes, a polar compound, but still it's not as, um, my guess is it's more likely to catch this than it is to catch this. Okay, um, and this can play a role if you're using drugs or things like that. And sometimes you can actually elute columns with acids or bases because if you could change something from um, covalent to ionic, you know, you might be able to wash it off the column because now it's ionic, similar to liquid liquid extraction if you have had um, organic chemistry. And if you haven't, you'll do that in the relatively near future. So I understand there's a lot going on here. I understand that me kind of rolling up and down with this is probably a little bit annoying at this point. Um, but I hope this gives you a little bit better idea of what we're trying to accomplish in the solid phase extraction lab. Just as one last reminder, please do be sure to use the lab manual because I have not given you um, enough details here to actually be able to do the uh, lab experiment in the lab manual. It's blown out. This is like, you know, most of a page. Um, so it gives you step-by-step -step instructions for how to do this. Also note, that this is a relatively um, individually quick thing to do once you have a little bit of experience at it. So if you feel like you did something wrong, if you forgot, you know, you, you, you conditioned the column with methanol and then you forgot the water and it didn't really work, well, that water is going to make a big difference. So just make sure um, you go back and you repeat it. Also, um, and you could talk to your TAs about this, there are efficient ways of washing these columns, okay, usually with methanol. Um, there are efficient ways of washing these columns and reusing it. So if you didn't get that nice tight line, but you think you did something wrong, you don't necessarily need to get another SPE column. You can just wash the one you have, 
um, talk to your TA about exactly um, how to do that because, again, it depends exactly where you are in the lab, um, which would be the most uh, efficient way of doing that. So uh, thanks for watching, and I hope this gives you a better idea of the solid phase ex extraction experiment.